Um, our unit one is still dealing with uh, struggles with love. So um, it's, it's obvious that some of us, I, I would say all of us, are, are struggling, you know, in some areas. But this area, we're really focusing on love, how to love God's way. And if you're struggling, it's always good to go back to the word of God and understand exactly how God loves us. Uh, love, God loves us in spite of our faults. God loves us in, sp in, spite of, uh, in spite of our failures. God loves us uh, even when we get on our knees and pray those prayers that sound so well, and only he and we know that we are not telling the truth. God still loves us. We serve a God that is a God of another chance and another chance and another chance, and uh, we have to love the same way. So we're going to learn some things as far as and we're going to what the Bible does is gives us a mirror to actually reflect on those areas that we need to improve in and move forward in, of course, with uh, the Holy Spirit's help. All right. So we cannot love the way that God loves um, and, or this how this love is defined without the Holy Spirit's involvement. Um, I know that many of us have tried loving on our own, but it does not work. I don't care how hard you try, we need the Lord's help. Amen. Amen. So feast of famine. All right. Feast of famine. Now, this is a phrase that you will hear, you know, um, and that, that you've heard before. So um, we've all physically, if we think about this feast or famine, we've all actually been on both sides. I'm sure that we've all uh, had periods in our lives where our bellies were full and where everything was going well and the bills were paid and the money is coming good. And then all of a sudden things start shaking it up. And then we can hit that famine to where uh, the bills may be late, to where the job may be lost, to where you stomach get to growling. Um, uh, uh, those friends that you had before are not your friends anymore. So both of us have lived physically, I believe, on both sides before. But I got to thinking about spiritually. Where are we spiritually with this? So which side are you on? I have a question here. And it says, how does the Christian move from spiritual famine to spiritual feast? All right. How does the Christian move from spiritual famine to spiritual feast? The way that we move, uh, move from uh, spiritual famine, okay, to spiritual feast is number one by Psalms 119 that thou, and 11. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against thee. So we have to understand that we have to read God's word, meditate on God's word, accept God's word for what it is. Uh, understand that God's word is not a buffet to where we can actually pick out and choose and select those things that we want to be obedient to or want to follow. We have to look at the whole book, the whole living word of God. And then two, in 2 Timothy 2.15, it tells us to study, to show ourselves approved. Okay, unto who? Only God, who is the author of this book, who is the author of the living word. And it says, a workman that needeth not be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth. So uh, studying God's word takes some work. Number one, it takes some sacrifices, which means we're going to have to learn how to put the, turn the cell phones off. We're going to have to learn how to um, uh, turn the televisions off, you know, and spend some time with the Lord because God has uh, a lot that he wants us to know and a lot that he wants us to understand. So moving from a feast, from a famine spiritually to a feast spiritually, you, we're going to have to do these things. Mm -hmm. So one thing that we learned before uh, going into a, a little bit of a review here is how do we study God's word? Are you satisfied with how you study God's word? Are you satisfied with your knowledge of God's word? Um, I have to ask, uh, answer that question for myself, and you have to answer the question for yourself as well. I'm not going to ask you to look at to the left or to the right. I'm just asking you to look in the mirror. My answer is no. So what, what that means is <clears throat> if I'm not satisfied, there's some things that I need to improve on when it comes to studying God's word. There's some things that we should do when we study the Sunday school lesson, study God's word. Number one, we have to start by praying. By understanding that God's word is God's word. God's word is inspired by God. Okay, that's the only way that someone named Moses could write the five books of the Bible and you're writing before and after your death. Okay, only God can inspire someone to do that. Understand that um, um, God's promises are in there. 
Um, Jesus Christ is in there. The Holy Spirit is in there. And then, too, I got to understand some things when I'm reading God's word. I need to understand the what, when, why, and where. Those are very, very important to understand. What is going on? You know, why is it happening this way? Where are the people located? What's going on during that time? All of those things should take place in your study of God's word. Now, I know that we've all heard uh, Pastor Parker talk about the rules of application. One is my favorite. I never want to give up on a lesson or say that I truly studied if I don't see the Jesus Christ in it. So if you have not seen Jesus Christ in every single lesson and being able to apply what you see to your life, then it's time to get back to study. All right. So this takes time. Yes, it does. And it takes effort on your part. But I can guarantee you that uh, if you decide to sacrifice for God's word, he'll definitely continue to bless you with what's already revealed in God's word as well. So you can actually go from looking at God's scripture from in black and white to actually going to 3D to actually going to 4D. All right. So from the pit to the palace. From the pit to the palace. So now we're going to do a little bit of a review. Do we remember what happened in last uh, week's lesson? Um, you know, when we talked, mm -hmm. and it came from Genesis 37. Mm -hmm. Do we, we remember a little bit of what happened? Um, was, they, uh, was Joseph um, favored by his brothers? No. no. What, wasn't favored by his brothers, were they? And, and no. also, um, did, did Jacob, Joseph's father, did he have a favorite? Yes. He did. And he had something that he gave Joseph, but did not give the rest of his brothers that the coat of many colors. Coat of many, many colors. All right. Yes. Coat of many colors. And and this was a distinctive coat that stood out amongst many. And those things of uh, the brothers did not like at all. You know, we understand that last lesson we talked a little bit about his dreams that he had. OK, uh -huh. we talked about his dreams that made his brothers even more upset. So when his brothers was out shepherding and jo um, um, Joseph was at home, um, Jacob sent his brother out, sends, sends his son out to go get the brothers. OK, mm -hmm. and then when he does this, they have already plotted for his death. All right. So instead of <laughs> uh, instead of trying to kill him, what they end up doing is they end up making it. Setting it. They end up making it to where he went in a cistern or went into a pit, as we call it. They threw him in there and then sold him. One thing that I thought is interesting before we go to uh, Genesis 39 was if you read in the scriptures in chapter 37, it talks about him actually being sold to Ishmaelites or Midianites. All right. And then it started interchanging those words. When you do a study on Ishmaelites or Edomites, um, guess what? They're all related. All right. This you will find out from reading the book of Judges. OK, it's one thing to know that. Guess what? All of them are related. Ishmael is from the grandfather, Abraham. All right. Who was born by Hagar. You remember Hagar? Oh, yes. OK. And when Sarah died, uh, Abraham married um, um, uh, Keturah. And Keturah had a son named Median. That's where the Midianites are from. So Midianites and Ishmaelites are all brothers, just like the descendants that came from um, 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 Rachel and Leah, and also the handmaids. So the brothers not only threw them in the pit and sold them, they sold them to family members who took him all the way to Egypt. All right? So you can only imagine what's going on. And I, I'm so thankful that Brother Collins brought it out uh, earlier when he logged on earlier that we have to keep in mind and we cannot forget that, guess what? Joseph is only 17 years old. Mm -hmm. He's only 17 years old and he's sold as a slave by his family members um, in Egypt to Potiphar. Now we understand that this journey was not a, a short trip. This journey took 30 days to get to Egypt, okay? But look at the timeline here in Genesis 39. Joseph is sold as a slave to Potiphar. Now there, we have to understand. It's something that you have to understand that really, uh, you can't miss it. Because if you read in the book of Genesis, especially in these chapters, it keeps saying the same thing. But the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, was with Joseph. Okay, right. 
L O R D, that's the Lord, uh, the self sustaining one, the one who don't need any help, the one who has the final say, the Alpha and the Omega, the Creator God. He was with Joseph. And if he's with Joseph, any other child of God, guess what? He's with you as well. Now, look, he went from the pit. And also, he was promoted as overseer in Potiphar's house. But then, mm -hmm. things were going well for Joseph, all right? He was still hurt by his, his, his brothers throwing him and selling him, you know, as, as well. In that long journey, he, he had nothing but to think about those things that happened, all right? But guess what? He was accused of rape. Mm -hmm. Now, everything is going well. He was accused of something that he did not do. So you have yes, to sir. Uh, mm -hmm. Joseph is a young man. He's a handsome young Hebrew man. He's in an Egyptian uh, uh, world to where, guess what? They, they are polytheistic. They, are, they have many gods. They serve many gods. Um, they are very knowledgeable. They have the best schools there. You know, they have some, it's totally different than the uh, background and where Joseph comes from. All right. And he, he's able to be promoted there. Why? Because the Lord is with Joseph. And any time that you have the Lord on your side, guess what? Nothing but good things will happen to you, no matter whether you're in the pit or outside of the pit. So what he ends up doing is when you are elevated, when you are handsome, when you really got it going on, guess what? Potiphar's own wife got to noticing. And when she got to noticing, she started thinking, this is a young man, you know, who I want. And she asked him on many occasions to sleep with him. So this woman is aggressive. Potiphar's Potter, wife is something else. All right. So yes, she, she is. She's very aggressive. <laughs> yes, sir. He, she's very aggressive. And so what he does is he does not sleep with her. In fact, he asked her this question. He asked, How when I can how, how can I do such wickedness and sin against God? Now you think that made her happy? No, one thing that she hated, an aggressive woman hates rejection. Okay, so what she did was when, when Joseph came in the house, in his master's house to do his duties or whatever, he said no. She grabbed his coat and actually uh, um, stripped it off, just a little piece of it. And when he ran one way, she ran to, uh, to the other masters of the house and told that he tried to rape her. And what he did was he was thrown into prison by Potiphar. So now one thing I want everybody to understand, we are big on our reputation. We are big on our name. We do care, and I don't care what anybody say. We care what people think about us, all right? But if you have been accused of rape and you know that you did not touch this woman and you uh, have nothing but the utmost respect for Potiphar and his house, but you were accused of these things, how do you think Joseph was feeling at this time? Lord, mm. You take me from being my favorite, the favorite son. You, my, my brothers hate me. They sold me. I was in a pit. I was in prison. I was sold. And then now I'm being blamed for rape. And, and you know, and I know I did not do this. And now I'm in an Egyptian prison with people who are guilty. Fast forward to Genesis 40. He meets some people. And we're building up to our lesson. He meets some people. It was a chief butler and a chief who was a cupbearer and a chief baker. All right. They also, mm -hmm. and what did they do to get in prison? They offended the king. Pharaoh. Okay. And we have to understand too, side note, Pharaoh is not a name. What it is, it's a title. Just like Mr. President or just like King David. All right. So, so this is Pharaoh, who is the king, who put these people in prison. All right. And Joseph meets these people, and what's disturbing to them, both of them have a dream, all right? Joseph is not only the, uh, the dreamer, God also is working with the others as well. They dream a dream, but they don't know interpreter too. they can interpret it. So guess who the interpreter is? Joseph. So even though Joseph is in prison, he's in the right place at the right time to, so God can accomplish his divine plan, all right? Mm -hmm. So how do we apply that to us today? We are in the right place at the right time so God can uh, um, accomplish his divine plan. Yes, you may not have the job you want, but you're in the right place at the right time so God can accomplish his uh, divine plan. Same thing with where you are in life. 
you know, you're at the right place. It may not feel right, but if you're a child of God, we know that all things work together for the good of mm -hmm. them and the called, who are called according to his purpose. You know, so those who love the Lord, we know they're working together, everything working together for the good. Joseph knows this, I believe, and you can understand this and how he, he uh, responds to them. He tells them that God is an interpreter of the dream. One of them had a dream. He told him his dream, his, his uh, uh, task and his responsibility as cupbearer, as the butler, will be restored. So that dream that you had with the vine that, that's, uh, that um, uh, connected the, the, to the branch, and, and you had the number three in there, the three branches, you know, what that means that three uh, was three days that he was going to wait. And guess what? He would uh, his duties and uh, his job would be restored into him. You look at mm -hmm. what happened to the other ones who had a, another dream. He wanted him, Joseph to interpret his dream as well. He dreamed of three baskets on his hand with all on his head <laughs> also represented three days. Mm -hmm. OK, but one of these baskets that was going to Pharaoh, the bear, the birds ate it away. And so this one would not live. So, so the chief baker did not have a good ending to his dream. That was some sad, that was some terrible news. But one thing that I like about Joseph, because we're able to see ourselves in there, one thing we love is we love to network. One thing that we love, we love a hookup. So what Joseph does is he tells the one that he knows is going to live, don't forget me. Remember me. I'm yes, sir. not supposed to be down here. But I need you to remember me when you go and you take on your old job duties back. When you go and you're reelected to your position, I need you to remember me. Well, what happened? He forgot him. Forgot it. Yeah. After three, after three days, yeah, they did go, and, and one did die, and the other one was restored. But he forgot him because how are we when we when everything's going good, we forget mm -hmm. about others. So I hope you can see yourself in this situation as well. We move on to Genesis 41, where we are today, where Pharaoh now is dreaming, okay? And, and he ha he's having a dream, and we're going to talk a little bit about his dream to where, uh, where we would better understand what's going on. But then after two years, the butler is going to remember Joseph, when in God's perfect timing, all right? When God in God's perfect timing. I know Joseph is thinking about how he got in this position in prison. I know he's thinking about this woman who lied on him. I know he's thinking about this, this, uh, these two men that he interpreted their dreams. And the one only request that he made for the one who would live for you to just remember me. Mm -hmm. I just want to be free. You know, I don't deserve to be here. You know, but it, you know, all those things are probably going through his head, but he did not ask the question why at all. So he finally, the cupbearer remembers Joseph, and then Joseph is placed in charge of Egypt as what? Ruler. You have to understand that. All Joseph wanted to be was free. So how should our prayers really go? Uh, we are praying these comfortable prayers, but you cannot, when you pray to God, you cannot forget his will to be done. You could be shortchanging yourself. If Joseph had only prayed for freedom, God says, no, I want, to, I want you to be made a ruler. And guess what? While I'm working with you, I'm also working with your brothers and your daddy back home. Because guess what? All things are working together, not only for you, but those who also threw you in the pit. I'm working on behalf of them, too. Through you, mm -hmm. I will be saved simply because I have not forgotten my own. And what I want everybody to understand, when we tackle this lesson, God has not forgotten you. Yes, you may be discouraged. Yes, you may you may feel down and out and depressed and, and confined within these four walls because of this pandemic. Yeah, you may not be able to breathe because of the mask you told to wear. Yeah, you understand that you may be laid off from your job because of downsizing during this time. Yeah, you understand that this pandemic and this election is more so than you think that you can bear. But guess what? If you are a child of God, as long as God is your father, you don't have anything to worry about because everything is working together for the good. All things. And guess what? In that scripture in Romans 8 and 28, you are not going through all things. You're just going through some things. But God says that all things are working. Yes, sir. 
for the good of them who love the Lord. So if you love the Lord and God is your father, then things are working together for your good. Amen? Amen. Now, we, that's the foundation. <laughs> We're going to look at the printed text in Genesis 41, 25 through 28. Will somebody uh, read those uh, few verses there? And Joseph said unto Pharaoh, can y'all hear me? Yes. And Joseph said unto Pharaoh, the dream that Pharaoh is one. God hath showed Pharaoh what he's about to do. The seven good kind are seven years, and the seven good ears are seven years. The dream is one. And the seven thin and ill-favored kind that came up after them are seven years. And the seven empty ears, blasted with the east wind, shall be seven years of famine. This is the thing which I have spoken to Pharaoh. What God is about to do, he showeth unto Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. Don't you say it? Just the 28? Yes, 28. Thank you, Sister Mays. I appreciate that. One thing that I love about Joseph, even though just being human, he was frustrated. But even, I don't see why. I don't see frustration in the scriptures at all. I even saw that with uh, Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist. Because when he was thrown in prison, he got so discouraged that he didn't ask the question, uh, uh, should we look for another? Is it somebody else? Because I don't think this is the way it's supposed to turn out. So, so this is, even though he's young, even though it's after 13 years of probably being in prison or whatever, even though he had all those times to just be bitter if he wanted to, he still acknowledged God. How do we know he acknowledged God? Because he understood that everything is, is working according to God's plan. He uh, told, um, he, he responded to Pharaoh because Pharaoh did have his dream. He had a dream of seven cows, okay? And, and, and depending on what version you read, it may be uh, known as kinds. Uh, that, that's cows, okay? And they were, mm -hmm. five, all right? And then when you look at that, that, uh, calves um, and, and cows are known to be, uh, especially back in those days, if you had a lot of cattle, that was wealth. You was prosperous. All right. If you look at uh, the story of Job, we had a lot of uh, cattle, you know, that was prosperous. If, if you look at Abraham, he had a lot of cattle that was prosperous. If you looked at Laban, he had a lot of cattle that was prosperous, you know. And, and, and then our Lord and Savior, our God, uh, he owns the cattle on a thousand, he, that's, that's property, he owned everything. So you look at these fat cows, okay, uh, uh, that, that, that the Pharaoh is dreaming about, but then he has seven that comes after the seven that eats, and he, these things are uh, ugly, okay? They're, they're malnutrition, they're, they're skinny. So what they do is those seven cows eat the, the fat cows. So the seven malnutrition cows eat the seven fat calves. But the thing mm. is, the seven malnutrition calves, the skinny calves, the ugly calves, still look that way. Yes, sir. They, they, they still look the same way they then gain a pound. does the fat calves. <laughs> so, so then Pharaoh, he woke up in the middle of the night, so kind of like we do in our dreams, and then what he ended up doing, he, he fell back asleep. Now he dreams of grain. Okay, it's on one stalk. He said seven grains of corn on, on one stalk and, and it was flourishing and looking good. And then he also looked at seven grains of, of, of corn that's on one stalk, but this was scorched by, 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 the, uh, by the heat. And then I like the way the uh, King James Version Luke uses the word wind because we know what happens to wind when, when fire, can, when fire uh, happens, it, it spreads. And what it did was it surrounded and choked the good grain and the good corn out. So you can only imagine what Pharaoh, the king, the leader is thinking. I need somebody to help me with this. So what he does is he calls. I, I, need, my, I need my wise men. I need them. I got to get my magicians. I, I got to get them. You know, I, I got to understand this dream because my spirit is not at rest until I figure this thing out. Nobody had any answers. The, mm -hmm. the, the wise men had no answers. Also, uh, uh, the, the, not only the wise men, but the other ones that he called the magicians, they did not have an answer to interpret the dream. Mm -hmm. And when you read in the book of Genesis and you, you read 
about Moses, you'll, you'll see a lot about those magicians because a lot of those magicians could do tricks. A lot of those magicians could do magic. A lot of those uh, magicians were known as, uh, uh, they studied the ast uh, astronomy and astrology. And what they did was they would actually look and, and take that, that wisdom or whatever, I wouldn't call it wisdom, but that intelligence that was given to them you know, and share it with others, you know. But guess what? They didn't believe in the only one and true God. But this they had no answer for. Only one, brother named Joseph, had an answer. So when you look, Joseph does explain, and so that Sister Mays explained to us, okay, the dream that you had, Pharaoh, because he's saying mm -hmm. that he can uh, interpret the dream, but he does not take the credit. I love the way Joseph responded when, 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 um, <laughs> When, when uh, the butler remembered him and the butler said, I know, I remember one, uh, you, you know, Pharaoh, when you threw me in that prison, I met a man who, who interpreted dreams and everything that happened, everything he said happened. You know, I received my position back and you know what you did to the other one. You know, mm -hmm. he was hung on the tree and the birds ate his flesh. You remember that one, you know, and everything that he did came to pass. So when, when uh, Pharaoh sent out for Joseph, guess what happened? They, they cleaned him up. They gave him a good bath. They showered him. Why? Because he was a prisoner. He wasn't. He wasn't looking good. He, he you know, he was dirty. <laughs> Hair was all over his head. They, they shaved him up and brought him before the king. And when the king asked him, "Can you interpret my dream?" I love his answer. Joseph could have said, "Yes, sir, I can interpret your dream. Do your dreams? Can you get me out of here?" <laughs> he, he could have had that response. But listen to what he responded and said. It is not in me. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. So he gave all the glory. He gave all the credit. The words that I'm going to tell you is all given by God. He didn't blame God for his condition or anything like that. But he didn't take the credit. He, didn't, he wasn't the glory thief. <laughs> he didn't take God's glory. He didn't take the compliment of simply being able to, 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 uh, to interpret dreams. He gave all the credit to God. He says, Pharaoh, the dream that you had, even though you, you dreamed of the cattle and you dreamed of the grain, it's one dream. One dream that has mm -hmm. one meaning. Okay? So the seven good kind, in, the, in other words, the seven calves, represents the years. Okay? In the seven uh, 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 grains of, of corn, that's seven good years. In verse 27, and, and the thin uh, and less favored, the, the ill looking, the, the ugly cows, you know, the, the ones that ate up the good cows, the fat cows, that's that's going to be the ones that are, are, are uh, that's going to be years of famine. Same thing that's happening with the grain that scorched and choked out the good grain. Seven years of famine. And he says in verse 28, he says, this is the thing which I have spoken unto Pharaoh, what God is about to do, he showeth unto Pharaoh. I love mm -hmm. how he took the opportunity to mention God. We have to take the opportunity to mention God to people at work, to our neighbors, to those that we run up against. It should be no doubt in everybody's mind that you are a, a Christian. Okay? It should be no doubt in anybody's mind whether you are a child of God. So what he did, I love it, when I put that in red there simply because this name of God he used is Elohim. And what that means, the one who has all power, the one who has all authority, the one who has all say-so. So, so when you look at that, you can't forget who's in the room. Okay? Because remember, you got the wise men in the room. You got the magicians in the room. But what Joseph does, an old prisoner, what he does, he, he brags on God. He doesn't yeah. brag on himself, but he brags on God. So every opportunity that we get, we should take it to brag on God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let, let's look. Because let's read verses 29 through 33. If somebody don't, don't mind, just read those verses. Behold, there come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt. <laughs> And there shall arise after them seven years of famine, and all the plenty shall be forgotten in the land of Egypt, and the famine shall consume the land. And the plenty shall not be known in the land by reason of that famine following, for it shall be very grievous. That part you say. And for, 
and for that the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice, is because of things established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. All right, now, that last one, sister. Oh, now therefore let Pharaoh look out, and look out a man discreet and wise, and set him over the land of Egypt. All right, I, I hope y'all saw that. What, what he does is he interprets the dream. He, he tells them exactly what's going to happen. And I love the way he used in verse 32, and God will shortly bring it to pass. In other words, this cycle of abundance, this seven years of abundance has not started yet. But look, Pharaoh, you know what? You, you know what you're going to need? I love it. See, Joseph is very wise. You know, he, he's 30 years old now. You know, this is not the 17-year-old who, who went talking about the dreams and, and things like that to a brother who, who brothers who cared, didn't care for him. He's telling and he's speaking at the right time with only what God has given him to say. One thing that we have to understand is whatever God gets you, what wants you to say, we have to learn how to speak up when it's time to speak up. We got to learn how to be quiet when it's time to be quiet. And whatever God has given you, don't you add your two cents to it. And don't you take away what God has given you to say. All right? I know I'm speaking to somebody. I know I'm not just speaking to myself here. What he does is, he says, listen how smart and with how wise Joseph is. He says, now therefore, let Pharaoh look out a man. Pharaoh, I, I don't know where you're going to find him. You know, I don't know where, but, but this man needs to be discreet. Mm -hmm. He, he needs to be wise. I don't know. He, he may be in front of you. I, I don't know. He may be talking to you, right? I don't know. I don't know, Pharaoh. But that man, you need to set him over the land of Egypt. You need to, you need Pharaoh to have somebody who can plan their work and work their plan. You don't need to just have anybody because this is your whole people. Right. This is your whole reputation, Pharaoh. You get the wrong person in this, mm. and guess what? You kill off everybody. That's mm. So, so, so Joseph knows what he's doing, all right? But most importantly, he see, he's seeing bits and pieces of God's plan play out. Now, I got a few questions for us. What's the difference between a dream and a vision, okay? We have to understand because we know that uh, um, um, John, who wrote Revelation, um, he had a vision, right? We know other people who had dreams, right? Because you even look at not only Joseph, but you look at... Um, um, uh, Mary, and you look at um, uh, uh, um, Joseph, the um, the who Mary was married to, the early father of Jesus Christ, who who had a, a, a dream. You you know you look at Peter, you look at Ezekiel, you look at Isaiah, you look at all these people who had dreams and and visions. So what's the difference? So a vision is when you are given a vision by God, okay, but you are wide awake, all right. You understand what's going on. Your eyes are open, but God gives you a vision of his plan. And also a dream is when you are asleep. But both of them are divine. And then two, um, they're given by God. So my question is, does God still communicate with his people using dreams and vision? And anybody can answer that. I yes. believe he does. Yes. 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 I know. Everybody agree? I, I, I know he does. I, I, who <laughs> said that? All of us are dream. And okay. So, but somebody said, I know he does. <laughs> Sister Phyllis Williams. Sister Williams, Williams said, I know he does. You know, because look at, uh, and I love just using scripture to, to answer questions. Okay. Because this is a good question. Some people believe that uh, God don't work that way anymore. You know, that, that's, that's Old Testament. You know, that, that he doesn't work that way anymore. But our Bible tells us, our living word tells us in Malachi 3 and 6, for I am the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, all right? I change not. Yes, sir. So however I worked back then, I can still work today doing the same thing. So don't hey, limit my, hey. don't yeah. limit, limit my power. Don't, this God, you don't put in a box. I'm the only one. You can't. He is, he is still working that way now. That's what this COVID is. It's bringing us back to him. That's a vision. So when you look at this, in Ecclesiastes 5 and, 5 and 3, it says, For a dream cometh through a multitude of visions, and a fool's voice is known by the multitude of words. In other words, 
our minds are distracted because all of us dream whether we remember it or not every single day. And mm -hmm. it's a scientific fact. All right. The only way that I, I remember my dreams is if I had some hydrocodone uh, the day before for pain or, uh, or I have some good dreams then. <laughs> or, or, yeah, that's, stuff, that's some strong stuff. And, and then, or if I was eating sweets before I, before I go to bed. You know, <laughs> all right. But but what 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 this verse is saying in Ecclesiastes five and three, I love the way how he puts it. Simply because what you are around, the people that you are around, what you put in your ears and in your minds, guess what? Therefore, you dream about. You put mess in your mind. That's what you dream about, and you wonder why it takes a, a pill for you to go to sleep, and you wonder why it takes a pill for you to wake up. You know, in order to get that good sleep, that good REM sleep or whatever, you got to actually watch what you put in your mind because that those things are what you may go to bed thinking about. In Philippians 4 and 8, it tells us what we should think about. It says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on those things, all right? Those are the things that we should think of. If you really want peace of mind, even when you go to sleep at night, you know, think on those things while you awake in the daytime, amen? Next question. When do we know when it's time for us to speak up versus remaining silent? This is a big time question. When do you know when it's time to open up your mouth and speak or be quiet? Just when the Holy Spirit compels. When the Holy Spirit compels. But 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 we sometimes can get impatient, right? We, yeah. we can get impatient. We, we <laughs> want to say it now. I, I got to speak my mind now. They need to know how they treat me. They need to know how they really living. They need to know why they always end up in this position. You yeah. know, so God is not always telling you to speak up. It's the reason why he's given us one mouth and two ears. And it's the time to keep silent, which means it's time to be quiet and a time to speak. Mm -hmm. And when it's your time to speak, it's time to speak. Because guess what? Your season. A lot of us, when it's our time to speak, wait for your season. Wait for your time. Wait for your season. A lot of times when it's our time to speak, what ends up happening? Uh, no, I'm just gonna pray about it. I, I don't want to rock the boat. I, I don't want. I don't want to say anything wrong. I, I don't. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. So, so we have to understand when it's time to speak. When it's time to be quiet. James one nineteen says, "Let every man be swift to hear." That means be ready to hear. Be willing to hear. Slow to speak. Slow to speak. Those are the words of wisdom. Those are the words of wisdom. Do we have any questions or comments so far? So as we progress and as we move on, it says in Genesis 41, 37 through 40. Okay, before we go there, it's a few verses that is skipped over um, in our printed text in the Sunday school lesson. Those 34, the verses 34 through 36, Joseph simply gives his, his famine plan, okay? to Pharaoh. So he said, in the years of abundance, what we're gonna what we need to do, Pharaoh, what you need to do is we need to collect as much grain as we can. And all these cities, we need to make sure that we store them. And we have to understand in order to truly get the context of these words that are being given divinely by God through Joseph, y'all, it, it's no refrigeration. It is no pesticide uh, control. It, it is no irrigation system to like like we know it. You know, it is not it's none of those things. So so when we think about that, we have to understand that that this is totally in control by God. Totally in control by God. Yes, God can control your feast. God can can take control in your famine. God knows everything that's going on. But one thing He's doing, He wants us to trust Him. You know, lean and depend on him for every single thing in spite of what we're going through, when we're going through it, at whatever point it is, still trust in the Lord. So verses 37 through 40, I'm going to read these. It says, and the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh. 
Now you have to understand who's still in the room. You got the magicians, you got the wise men, you got Pharaoh, and you also got Joseph. These things that Joseph is saying, he's speaking. It's his time to speak, and he's speaking well. He was good in front of the eye, in the eyes of Pharaoh, and guess what? In the eyes of all his servants. So all them wise men, all those well knowledgeable men, the magicians, and all the the wise men. Guess what they said? Uh huh. <laughs> I agree with Joseph. That's what they say. You, you show right. I think he's saying the same thing. I think he's saying the right thing. I think you should listen to him, Pharaoh. So, so what I love about this is this is a Hebrew, y'all. We cannot forget this. These are Egyptians. And Egyptians have their own mindset of how they think about Hebrews. Some of us work around people that do not look like us, do not vote like us, do not act like us, don't believe the same things that we believe, but how did you end up in that office? God can allow people who don't even like you to end up selecting you for that position. That's why we understand that God can make your enemies your footstool. You yes, sir. A polytheistic pharaoh, a polytheistic king and servants that do not believe in the one and only true God, and you just stand uh, uh, God-centered and speaking whatever God has given you to say, not adding anything or not taking anything away. And you got people like Pharaoh and his merchants and, and, and his servants saying, yes, sir, you're right. Only God can do something like that. I don't want you to miss that. It says, and Pharaoh said unto his servants, can we find such a one as this is? A man in whom the spirit, listen to what he said. What you know, Pharaoh, about the spirit of God? See, <laughs> God is so obvious. God is so evident when you're just following his lead. When you're following the good shepherd, he won't lead you. Yes, sir. He'll show you some things and even show the enemy some things that, that, that's, that's surprising even to him. Where did he get these words? Through meeting Joseph. I can guarantee you before he met Joseph, he wasn't talking about the spirit of God. Amen. So, so when you walk into the room, do you, do you light it up? Or does the room stay just as dark when you enter it? Uh -huh. This is what it says in these uh, oh, 39 and 40. I end read simply because this is the key text in our uh, uh, printed text here. It says, and Pharaoh said unto Joseph, listen to what this pagan king said. He says, for as much as God has showed me all this, there is none. All right. This means none. None means none. <laughs> all right. Mm -hmm. not, not even me, Pharaoh is saying, that is so discreet and wise as thou you thou art. In other words, we got That's you good. right one. In other words, promoted. In other words, you got the job. In other words, whatever God you serving, I'm going to let y'all do the lead. Now, I'm still Pharaoh, but we're going to follow your lead. So we're going we're to give you a position. We're going to give you a place, Joseph. So you, take, you see how he's taking them from the prison, clean them up. And all this happened, I don't know whether it's the same day, but I know it was quick. It says, thou should be over my house. That's placement. And according to thy word, shall my people, all my people, be ruled. That's privilege. Only mm -hmm. in thy throne will I be greater than you. He was appointed. Now, Pharaoh, in his mind, he thinks that he's really doing this, like he has some power. Just like the supervisor on your job think that they got some power to, to, to do what they want to do to you. You know. And see, we have to understand that we, we only have one boss. All right. Yo, yo, you I understand the chain of command, but but you only have one boss. And that boss is God. Yes. So yes, sir. As long as you do things that's pleasing to him and in favor of him, then you cannot go wrong. I love this in Genesis 41, 50 and 52 is our printed text. But there's some things that goes on in 41 through 49 that I cannot let you miss. Okay, Joseph is authorized to work his plan. Joseph is, <laughs> that cloak is taken, you know, from him. And, and, and he's put in a position. How do I know he's put in a position? Because the king, Pharaoh, Gave him a ring. I don't know whether you remember uh, the prodigal son, but when the prodigal son came back, he put a ring on his finger. 
That shows his placement. He also let him ride in the same chair that he rode in. That shows everybody else, you need to respect anybody who's in this chariot. He gave him place. Now, this man was just a prisoner. This man was just known as a rapist. And, and now he got the king's ring on. Now he's in the, the king's chariot. Or, or, you know, now he's riding around with the king and has placement, you know, and, and he's telling and giving all these orders. But you have to understand where he come from. He was a slave for almost half his life. He was a prisoner for almost half his life. Guess who's going to do the work? Hmm. The slaves. Who know how to identify with the ones in the prison? Who was placed as, as over all the ones in the prison by the warden? Joseph was. So while some of, some of us, if we're honest with each other, while you would have been complaining, while we would have been complaining, Lord got me in this place, and I ain't done nothing to nobody. He understands some things. God is still promoting him, even in prison. He's still promoting him as ruler. And guess who? The ones he's going to get to do the work, he already gained their respect. So it says in, verses, in, in, in verse 50, it says, And unto Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came. Wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. You mean that you got kids? Well, who did you marry? Well, the king... Gave him a priest's daughter. All right. Now, this priest's daughter was not one who was monotheistic, who believed in the one and true only God, but we do understand that, that he did marry and he had two, not one but two sons. We're going to read about here shortly. But what he ends up doing is he ends up having kids before famine. Now, in many of our minds, is wait a minute, Joseph, that's, that's not smart. What you going what you going to feed them? Where, where are you going to go when, when this famine hits? It, it, don't you want the best for your kids? You already got the wife, but don't you want the best? But when you know that you know that you know that, that our God who has the first say-so is going to have the last say-so, the one who gave you the dream, the one who took you from the pit to the prison, yes, sir. Talk, man. And also to the palace as ruler, is the same one. You know what? You may as well go in and have you some kids, Joseph. Go on and live in abundance. Go on and have favor with God. And that's what I'm telling you all today, who are visiting and those who are members of Pilgrim Progress. If you are a child of God, you know, you don't have to wait at all. Go ahead and live and, and seek God's guidance or whatever. So he has the kids, all right, before the famine. And it says, which is sinner, it says, the daughter of Potiphar, the, the priest of On, Bear unto him, all right? It says, and Joseph called the name of the firstborn what? Manasseh, all right? Which means to forget. Which means to forget. So listen to what it says. For God said he, have he made me forget my toil and all my father's house. Which means, is this is not saying that Joseph forgot where he came from. This is not saying that he forgot how hard it was. This means that Joseph's heart probably was hardened towards some of the things that was done towards him by his family members, by the, the Potiphar's wife, by the things that he, people that wronged him, and he hadn't done anything to. So what he meant was, I let it go. My firstborn is named Manasseh, forgive, forgiven, or, or what I'm doing is it made me forget, which means I'm forgiving, I'm letting it go. And the name of the second called Ephraim. Guess what? That means twice fruitful or doubly fruitful. I don't know where that went for the firstborn, uh, the secondborn, counting both of them together as a double being fruitful and multiplying right before a famine. But it says, for God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Y'all don't see what I'm telling y'all. I was a prisoner here. I'm a Hebrew here. I'm giving Egyptians orders who look down on me. I'm mm -hmm. People who are more intelligent, who and who think and have all these letters behind their name, what to do? Yeah, I know what God has done for me. Now, now, what God has done for you—that's your testimony. But, but what Joseph's saying is, I want you to understand through today's Sunday school lesson. If you understand what God has done for me, He will do it for you. All you have to do is continue to list, look at Him. Continue to look at him, continue to focus on him and who he is. So with those things, what can we take away from today's lesson that we come to a close? 
Number one, we probably won't get to interpret dreams like a king, but those who know you should be, uh, those who uh, those who know you should be able to see God in you through your kind words, merciful acts, and wise advice. Do your relatives, neighbors, and coworkers see you as a person in whom God, uh, whose spirit of God is in? That's a good question. Now, point number two: In each situation, Joseph learned the importance of serving God and others. Whatever your situation, no matter how undesirable, consider it part of your training program for serving God. Number three, instead of asking God why, just ask him what's next. In other words, since that didn't work for me, what do you have next for me, God? Since I thought that job was for me, I thought you were lining it all out, but I didn't get the job. So it must not be meant for me to have the job. So what's next for me? That marriage that I thought was right, that, that man or that woman I thought was right for me, it didn't work out. What, what, what do you have for me? What's next, God? Because I know one thing that won't change, and I'm your child. Because I know you're not an Indian giver. And once I'm in your hands, you won't let go of me. Even if I go astray, even if I don't do the right things like I always should, Lord, I understand that you are my father. So it's one thing that I want to end up with number four. It says, plan your work and work God's plan. Now, I know some of you may know this to be plan your work, work your plan. Guess what? If you plan your work, because God wants you to have a plan, that's why he gave you a mind. But he also wants you to understand that it's all about his divine plan. Yes. You know? So your plan don't work all the time. Your plan is not always best. I don't care how you put it together. And if it doesn't align with God's plan, you may as well ball it up and throw it away. 